All right, hey everybody, Alec Torelli here, and welcome to a sort of unique episode of The Hand of the Day, where I'm gonna be doing this live for the very first time, and so I wanna thank everyone for joining me here today. Um, I got hands that I'm gonna review from Robert, who's gonna be joining us. Robert, what's up? He's hey, a, a member of our Conscious Poker Elite Mastermind group, and he's been kind enough to join us here on this call and share two hands that he played which um, we're gonna review. So I've put them into a hand replayer for you guys like we do for the hand of the day. And we're gonna review them here, take some questions, talk Robert through the hand, give you guys a little bit more in-depth strategy than we usually have time to go into um, for the show and uh, answer any questions that you guys have after the show as well. Hopefully gonna make this a regular thing. I'm hoping to have more live hand of the day episodes and um, be able to answer your questions and interact with my audience in real time. That's really what the purpose of these episodes is, is to get to know everybody a little bit better and actually get some interaction going because YouTube is, you know, it's kind of like, I like it, but it's like, you're just talking to a camera. You know, I'd really like to talk to, to you guys and just say thank you for everyone for your support. And um, this it seems like a great way to do that. So without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm going to share my screen and first introduce Robert here. Robert, why don't you tell us a 15 second rundown, um, where, you, where you're from, what you play, one fun fact that nobody knows about you, and um, sure, come say hi. Hey guys, uh, first off, uh, I'm real honored to be here uh, with everybody. Uh, thank you guys for taking a look at how badly I played some hands. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, I play tournaments, uh, small stakes tournaments and cash games, and uh, I've been playing okay. ever since uh, about 2004. So um, um, one small fact about me, is uh, I was in the Navy for nine years that, you know, maybe you guys might not have known. So that's where I learned how to play cards on the ship. So, uh, all right, that's pretty much all about me. And again, I'm very honored to be here, Alec. Thank you for having me. Thank you and thanks for sharing. Um, sweet, man. So let's do it. I'm gonna share my screen here. This is a hand that you sent me. Um, we're in a tournament, 800, 1600 blinds. We got King 10 in late position and um, yeah, I'd like to hear some of your thought process in the hand. The first thing that I'm sort of noticing here is that there's eight players at the table and we're in mm -hmm. late position. So regardless of our hand, I'm mostly looking for, you know, is this a good spot to open? How deep am I relative to the other stacks? And how are they playing in this particular spot? Um, before I'm even dealt my first two cards, I'm sort of sizing up the situation and looking for, you know, is this a good spot? How loose am I gonna be when I open here? Um, what types of hands am I gonna be opening with? Am I likely to get three bet? Am I likely to steal the blind? So those are sorts of questions I'm asking myself even before my first two cards are even dealt in a spot like this. So I'm gonna be asking you some questions here, Robert, too, in a sec, but I'm gonna walk us through the hand just to get to some of the juicy stuff that, that happens here. So we get a couple folds and we open to, we limp to 1600, um, folds around and the big blind makes it 3400 and we opt to call. We have a very clear call here. So I think everyone would agree that, you know, calling a min raise when the big blind opens when we're in position is totally standard. But I think what's a little bit more interesting is the limp, the choice to limp here. So walk me through a little bit about what you were thinking there in that limp. Give us a okay. you know, 20 second rundown. No problem. Um, this player just got moved to the table uh, a hand before. Uh, he was kind of a young type of internet type type of a player. Um, he played one hand and I noticed when he raised pre-flop, he like started clenching his teeth. So I'm like, all right, that's a little tell. And then on the flop, he immediately bet again and everybody folded. So I'm like, okay, next hand, you know, I'm going to pay attention to that little tell. And actually when he raised it this hand, he did the same thing, you know, he clenched his teeth and I was like, okay, maybe he's got something big in the big blind, but I want to, you know, I want to get some information. So that's why I limped at first because I wanted to play a hand with them. Okay. Why not just come out raising to begin with and give yourself two chances to win the pot. One is if you have the best hand and you win the pot post flop, uh, but two is win the pot immediately with that raise if everybody folds. Yes. Um, I, that's, Great point. I never really thought of that, but, um, you know, I just, I had no information on him and yep. Totally I fine. Thought he was just being aggro. 
Yeah, I mean, limping is a fair strategy too, especially in late position. It's not used as often in tournaments, but it could be quite effective if you're limping in with hands like this that don't really want to play in a raised pot as much. Um, like something like Jack-10 offsuit that doesn't really want to be in a raised pot as much as um, maybe someone like King-Queen that is raising for value, um, but that still is warranted to see a flop, right? Still have a hand that's good enough to see a flop. Limping could be an effective strategy. Um, and as long as you're limping with a little bit of a balanced range, that's the key here, is that you're not just limping only with trash hands, but you're throwing in some creative limps there. I remember when I was in uh, Monaco playing in the main event, uh, the European Poker Tour main event at the time, it was a really interesting hand where uh, it gets folded around to Steve O'Doyer in the cutoff, and he open limps behind a limper. So limp, and he limps behind a limper, and it got to showdown, and he had two aces. I thought that was a really creative strategy because it's so, it looks so weak when someone limps in a spot like that. It looks like, oh, he just has nothing. But in fact, he limped with aces, hoping that someone raised behind him and he could trap everybody in the hand. It was a really creative play. It did work out to his advantage, but I'm not being results oriented. I actually think plays like that have a lot of merit. So if you're going to adopt a limping, limping strategy here, let's make sure that we're limping with some weak, like mediocre hands like King 10, but also some big hands, maybe like some big pairs as well. Okay. So we end up calling here, which is totally fine. Um, let's take a flop. Heads up. Flop queen nine four. He bets 3,000. And I think here we have a pretty clear call. We're in position. We're getting three to one. And we have an overcard and a gut shot to the nuts. And perhaps, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if what you were thinking perhaps is also that if your opponent checks the turn, you could bet and win with a bet on the turn as well. So you're kind of thinking ahead when you're calling here. Yes, and that's another thing I forgot to mention is, um, you know, I, f I figured if I limped pre um, and he did raise it, I did have position on him the whole hand. So I, I forgot yep. to say that. Totally. And that's one of the huge advantages of, of a, being in position on the flop here is you're not just calling for the straight value of your hand, which is an overcard, a gut shot. Maybe you have the best hand if he has like 7-8 suited, maybe. Um, but you're mainly calling, or you're also calling, not mainly, you're also calling not only because of your pot odds, but also because if your opponent checks the turn, you could go ahead and take a stab and win with a bet representing something like King Queen. Okay. I felt I felt this bet, um, Alec was just like a little, I felt like he was floating. And, I, you know, I don't know if it was just because of the bet size or if it was just because of, you know, just my overall impression of him as a player, but I just felt he, you know, he was just betting air right there. Yeah, he could. I mean, so you're playing li just just to keep everyone up to speed. You were playing live poker, so we don't have all the information that you had. And I'm all about using real time reads to help you distinguish uh, hand reading ability. So you know, when you're in real time and you have real time reads, I would make those uh, take account of those and and see how they potentially impact the influence the range of hands that my opponent could have so if you read him as weak it gives even more credence to floating the flop here because you know, you're more likely to be able to take the pot away on the turn of the river because you think he's weak. if like you said pre-flop he had that jaw clinching hell and you think he's strong then you know maybe you got to be a little more careful of that right so i would go a lot with my real-time reads and um you know i, I would trust those I would trust those as well. But even, let's say, reads aside, because we're analyzing this hand just in a vacuum at face value, I still think calling here is totally fine. Let's go okay. to the turn where things get pretty interesting. Um, so you call, you hit a great card on the turn, uh, bringing a king. Now your opponent bets 6,000, which is half pot here. You make it 12,000. You min raise here. Now yes. what are you thinking in this spot? Why go 12,000? Um. I was going off the flop, and uh, like I was saying with my read, like I felt that he was just uh, – if at best he had like an ace-queen or if he had, was just betting uh, with some type of, uh, you know, uh, another pair like pocket tens or something, then I wanted to raise with top pair and with my draw as well, my back door, you know, um, with the jack. But I felt yeah. like my king was good there, and I just wanted to see, you know, if he would just continue with me or – that, that was my thought at the time. I okay. was really happy to be the king, first of all. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things, let's go with the pros first. One of the things I like about raising is that you sort of take control of the hand. 
And this min raise imposition on turn is an effective strategy if you want to get a cheap showdown. So if you had something like queen 10 here and you didn't know whether or not your opponent was bluffing and you wanted to just get to showdown, you can make it 12,000 here and then your opponent calls and instead of him betting 12,000 on the river, you're only putting in 12,000 on the turn. So you're, instead of him betting 6,000 on the turn and 15,000 on the river, where you're facing a total bet of 21,000, you're putting in a min raise of 12,000 on the turn and you're saving yourself that difference of 9,000. So you're saving yourself what he would have bet on the river by taking command of the pot on the turn. This is a good way to get the showdown cheaply when you have hands that are strong enough to get the showdown with but that aren't necessarily strong enough or that don't really want to be put in a tough spot on the river when facing a bet, right? The other advantage of raising here is you also charge your opponent if he has a worse hand. If he was betting something like ace-queen or a worse king or a draw like ace-10 or a heart draw or something like that, um, now you charge him and you basically force him to put money in the pot with a worse hand. Whereas if you just called on the river, he could play perfectly. So I'm okay with raising the turn from that standpoint, but I think from a range balance standpoint, it's better just to call here. Um, I don't know why there's lines in my screen. Uh, you're gonna wanna just be calling this turn a lot of the time, right? Cause you're gonna wanna call this turn with a king because you wanna call this turn also with a queen or a nine. And so from a range balance standpoint, I think it's just more, um, you're more balanced if you just adopt a calling strategy here with all of your hands, right? The other side about raising here is if you get jammed on, you kind of are in a really tough spot. You sort of have to call, but you sort of have to fold at the same time. Like you don't really want to have to call it off here, but you don't want to fold out your equity. So um, I would be a little bit cognizant of that as well. For that reason, I think I would just call here and not allow my opponent to raise and then plan on calling the river, depending on my live read, but almost always plan on calling the river. Does it make, uh, Alec, does it make any sense to say that uh, since I have a king and a 10 in my hand, like uh, the 10 would be a blocker to hands such as like a jack 10 or, you know, like a king queen, like I wouldn't have to worry about those hands or should I still be like, uh, cognizant of those types of hands as well? well it's a good question. I really like that question. And yes, the fact that you have a 10 makes it less likely he has a jack 10. The fact that you have a king makes it less likely he has king, any king. But he can still have hands like queens, aces. He could still have ace king. He could still have ace queen. He could have pocket nines. He could still have jack 10. I mean, you don't block that many combos, right? You just have four queens. Basically, it's like you know, how many times have you gone top pair to top pair in, in a game, right? Just because you block one of the combos doesn't mean that you block, you know, all of them. So, okay. um, can we have people, let's see, are people muting their mic here? We have some mic audio issues. Hold on. Do you have some audio stuff in the background, Robert, or no? Yeah, uh, it seems like it's gone now. Uh, I actually thought it was me. I might, I muted mine <laughs> for a little bit. <laughs> okay, yeah. So maybe just mute it. I'll mute you when you're not talking. Um, so, I think overall this turn is probably just better played as a call. I think it allows you to adopt a more balanced strategy. And um, as played, uh, I would basically be hoping for him to call and then probably plan on checking the river. So I'd be min raising here, hoping that he calls the turn and then the river can go check, check. And in case he has something like ace king or king jack or even king queen, maybe he's gonna call the turn with that hand um, or, or aces if he has those types of hands. Now I get to see the river cheaply. And if I improve, I could bet again. If I don't improve, I'm just gonna check behind, hope to win the pot that's already big enough and perhaps save myself some money the times that he has me beat. At the same time, I could also charge him for calling with worse draws, hands like ace five of hearts that you know he might play perfectly with on the river. Now he's forced to put in another bet with on the turn. So that would be what I would hope to do while raising. Um, and so let's see what happens. He does end up calling, which is great for us. The river is an excellent card for us. And now he checks. Um, we have a very, I think we have a clear bet here at this, at this point in time. Um, that's what I felt too. I, I just felt like, you know, when he checked it, it was just like, you know, I, I just felt like I had to put something out there just to get, I mean, maybe I could have checked it and that's, 
you know, part, part of the reason uh, why this hand is so tricky, but um, you know, I just felt like I had to put something out there. I didn't want to put anything too big out there, but I thought yeah. I had the best hand. I also really like betting small here, something like 13, 15,000. You don't want to go all in or bet too big because it's too risky that your opponent's going to either, either fold a hand that's worse than yours, something that you want to get value from like ace queen or aces, or he's going to only call with hands that are better than yours. Let's face it. He could still have you beat with hands like better Kings or a straight, All right? So he, there's, or a set, like he could kind of Queens full or whatever. He still could have hands that have you beat. So I would plan on betting this river and probably folding to a check raise because your bet looks so strong. Um, you don't have to call here. If he check raises you, he's never going to check raise this river without having a boat. So I don't, re- I wouldn't really be worried about, getting bluffed off my, the best hand on the river here. So I would bet like 13,000, try and get him to hero call with something like aces, uh, maybe 12,000, something pretty small, fold to a check raise and go from there. Um, so I'm going to open this up for a second here, actually to other questions. Let's go through the results here. I know Raphael has a question as well. Um, so you bet 12,500, which I love. I love that bet sizing. It's small enough to get him to call from a worse hand. Um, doesn't only, you know, prevent him from calling with, with hands that are better. He ends up calling, he does turn over ace king. So if we didn't improve here, I guess this is one of the merits of raising here on the turn, going back to the turn, this is kind of like the benefit of raising. Um, if you, by do raising, by raising this turn now, ace king, you're going to lose less money against this hand than you would have if you just called. Because if you just called the turn, I mean, obviously you hit a king on the river, so you bet again. But had you just, had the river been a deuce, it's going to go check, check, and you're going to lose 12,000 total against ace king. Whereas if the river was a deuce, he's going to bet, and you're going to lose double that amount because you're going to lose his turn bet plus his river bet. You're going to have to call. So I like overall, um, overall, we had some good logic here. I think there's some things we could have done differently, some things we could learn to, to improve on. But I think it's a really, really interesting hand. I'm going to open this up for questions. Uh, I want to get to Raphael as well here. I saw he had a hand up. Can you raise your hand, buddy? I'm looking at this. Um, hang on. Raphael, unmute. What's up, my man? You had a question? Sort of. I unmuted you, man. Nope. Raphael's not, not with us. Yeah. Hello. Hey, hello. What's up, man? Raphael, you had a question? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to say that, don't you think that raising the turn also like throw away all his, his bluffs and like, yeah, we throw, throw away all his hands. Yeah. That's another great question. So going back to the turn here, uh, when we do raise to 12,000, Yes, that's the downside of raising. And I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned that as clearly uh, as you did. So thank you for that. You do prevent him from bluffing. So if he does have something like 7-8 and he's just barreling away now trying to rep something like ace-king or rep something like aces or rep a set or two pair or a straight, you prevent him from doing that by raising because now he's going to fold with his bluffs. So if he has something like even ace-jack, Ace 10, and he's just barreling away. The king is a good card for the villain to bluff on because the king could have hit his range. The king is also a bad card for our range. There's less kings in our range than there are in our opponent's range. He could have ace king easier than us because we didn't raise preflop. He can still have over pairs. He can have sets. We can't really have those hands. So our opponent's range is still stronger than ours. He's still going to become out firing a lot. And when we take away the bluff, um, you know, it's potential that we lose out on, on money like that. So I would use real time reads in this situation. If I'm playing a live cash game to really try and figure out, you know, where I think my opponent's at in this hand as well. Like if I think he's stronger, I'm going to definitely lead towards defense and, and, and calling. Um, I think calling is just a more balanced strategy. If I think he's weaker, definitely going to want to just flat call and not take away the bluff here. So it depends on kind of like the read that you have on your opponent. I think either way, I'm going to be a little bit, I'm going to just go, I'm probably just going to call the turn regardless, but um, that would play into my decision on the river, whether or not I was going to hang on to the hand, depending on what the river was. So that's a really good question. 
Um, yeah, also, also, I'd like to ask uh, if we raise the turn. <clears throat> also, what do, what we do if he shoves all in? Then, yeah, that's a good question. I think if I raise this turn and get jammed on, I'm going to fold. Um, I don't really love raising the turn because of, of that. I don't really like folding out a hand that has so much equity. But I just think if you look at the types of hands he's going to jam with, they're going to be very, very strong premium hands and very few bluffs. I think our opponent has so much incentive just to call. If he has, even if he has like ace five of hearts, yes, he could turn it into a bluff and jam. But like 90% of players in real time are just going to call there because they're like, whatever, I'm getting a great price. Maybe my opponent has a straight or two pair. They put you on a really good hand. They think you're going to call it all off on the turn. Why would they risk jamming it all in when they could just call and play pot control, guarantee themselves making a profitable call, calling 6,000 to win 30. They're getting five to one. They're definitely going to be making a profitable call with any hand that has equity that's reasonable. Why would they risk jamming it all in and be wrong when they don't know what you have? So if they do jam, it's because they probably have a monster I'm going to fold. Even ace king just called this turn. It's too loose to jam with ace king because you're only going to get called by better. So I think our opponent's jamming range is very polar and very weighted towards strong value hands, hands like king queen. So I'm going to be folding here if I get jammed on, on the turn. But I think you have to have these. So like one of the things I'll say about this hand and these types of spots in general is I think it's really important to have these spots like ironed out before you um, even go into the hand, right? So like you don't want to be making plays here um, in a spot like this without knowing what your play is going to be if a probable event happens. So when I'm raising the turn here, before I even consider, before, while I'm considering whether or not I want to raise or call the turn, I'm thinking, what will I do if he jams? What will I do if he calls? What am I going to do if he min three bets? What am I going to do on different rivers? What am I going to do if the river's a heart? What am I going to do? What rivers am I going to value bet? Why am I raising the turn? Am I raising the turn to get to showdown cheaply so that he doesn't value bet bigger than I want to call? Like, what do I think about his hand range in this particular spot? So, like, I'm asking myself this question. I'm having this internal dialogue so that – could someone mute their mic? Sorry. Uh, so that when I get raised on the turn – then, or when I'm playing the turn before I even raise, I kind of already know what I'm thinking in that particular spot. So that's, that's really important because you want to make sure you're making plays for the right reason, excuse me, right reasons. And walking yourself through that internal dialogue is a great way uh, to do that. So let's jump into the next hand. I think we covered this hand pretty well. Um, let's jump into the next hand here because this one's pretty interesting as well. And um, all right, so we got another interesting hand here. I'm already playing. Whoops. So, all right, we'll do one more hand. Been on. Okay, so we got 4,000, 8,000 blinds, still with Robert here. And um, let's see, we're pretty, I mean, we're one of the bigger stacks at the table, but the average stack is very, very shallow. So one thing I'm looking at right away is just, you know, what are the other stacks and um, like how big is my stack relative to the other stacks? That's basically just tournament strategy, right? But I don't really care about any of that when I have kings because I'm going to be playing this hand regardless. Um, so min raise to 16,000. And well, Alec, could I, could I ask a quick question, Alec? Go ahead, go ahead. With this hand... Um... This was uh, two from the uh, two from the money. Uh, there was twenty two players left, and um, I think I was a top five stack. I think there was about three million in play, and everybody else at the other table was like on fumes. So I think there was two three tables total because there was twenty two players, and um, you know there was only really one person at the table. Um, I don't think the stack next to me had that big of a stack, but there was one person that could take me out, and that was the villain in this hand. So, um, yeah, yeah just, so, so you're basically the second big stack of the table, which we see reflected. Yes. I mean, you're tied with a couple other stacks, but you're one of the big stacks of, in the table. Um, so one of the things that you're going to be one of considering here, not just with your specific hand, but in general, is just who has stack leverage. So applying pressure on other stacks is a great um, 
tactic to use in this spot. So you're going to think that, you know, if you three bet here hypothetically against the under the gun opener, he's going to have to fold so many hands because of ICM, right? ICM is going to tell us, independent chip modules are going to tell us that his, the value of his stack is not going to increase as much by winning the pot as it will decrease by busting. And that's true because of the phenomenon that if you win all the chips in the tournament, you don't win all the money. You win 20% of the money. So each chip has less value than the preceding chip, which means that you have to play really, really tight when you are on bubbles because you don't get, you win chips if you're on the bubble, but if you bust someone, you don't win money. So when you're on the money bubble, you know, the, the, the GTO strategy is to fold a lot to reach the money if you're up against a stack that's bigger than yours. So this is a great spot to three bet or to open if you're you, just because other stacks aren't going to really play pots against you. They're going to leave you the pot uncontested. So in this spot, um, I would definitely be three betting here. I wouldn't really want to call and play this pot three ways when you're so close to the bubble. I would be three betting here to like 40,000. Also, this is not a terrible spot to go for a bluff of like even 36,000. You can go a little bit smaller just because any three bet size is basically going to commit your opponent to his entire stack. So he's not really going to be calling here out of position facing a three bet. He's going to jam or fold. And for that reason, I think you could go smaller, even something like 36,000. You opt to go to 40,000 here, which is fine. Um, I mean, it's not a mistake to go 40,000 with Kings. Let's be honest. You could jam here as well. And it's not a mistake. Um, but I think I like a smaller three bet because it allows you to be bluffing a little bit more. Uh, looks a little bit more suspicious. We get a okay. cold ball here in the small blind. And um, then everybody else folds. So right away I'm thinking he probably has a good hand, like a pair, like, not you know, nines, tens, jacks, queens. So yeah, Alec, like it, it, it was funny because uh, he was kind of shifting around his seat. He was kind of looking like he didn't want to call, but then he wanted to call. And then I'm thinking, you know, obviously the worst case scenario, aces. But is he doing a bad job acting? You know, I was thinking all those thoughts were running through my mind. But, you know, I just uh, – I knew what I had. But he eventually called me, and I was just hoping for a nice flop. Totally. And you got one. Um, so 9-7 deuce, he checks. Here I'm going to bet – and try and get him to – I'm just going to commit all the money here. If he has something like tens, jacks, queens, I'm going to try and get value from those hands and, and basically bust them, right? I'm, I think this is a spot where if he has aces, you're going to lose. If he has nines, you lose. But there's less possibility of that than there is of tens, jacks, and queens. Um, or maybe he has the same hand okay. and he has kings. So uh, I also think aces might just jam preflop, depending on your live read. Nines might just fold preflop. So it's likely at this point he has something like ace, king, ace, queen, which may call a bet. Or he has something like tens, jacks, or queens. Right? So I'm going to go for a bet here um, and just basically plan on getting it in. Um, you bet 40,000, which is fine. He goes for a check call, and here I'm basically confirming my read. I think we eliminate some hands from his range. Probably ace-queen might just fold here. So I think it's really, you know, ace-king is probably unlikely. He's probably going to jam with that preflop. So I think he probably has, you know, tens through queens. It's just the most likely holding, right? It really feels like that's what he has here. So turn 184,000 in the pot. I don't really see a reason – to turn this into a three street game. I don't really see a reason to, okay. to, to bet 30,000 here and then bet the river. I basically, you know, you have a half pot bet left. You're on the money bubble. The pot's big enough. He's going to either call. I also don't see a reason to bet small on the turn and then have like an ace come or something on the river. Um, I would just go all in. If I'm going to play the hand, I'm going to go all in on the turn. If I'm going to bet my hand, I'm going all in on the turn trying to get value from tens through queens, protect my hand as well, um, and go at it that way. If I had 500,000, then I, I could see a reason for betting the turn. If I had 300,000, I could see a reason for betting the turn. But with a half-size pot, half pot bet left, I'm just going to bet it. 
So here I'm just going all in and expecting to get called, expecting to double up, expecting to win. That's what I'm hoping to happen. We go ahead and bet 40,000 here, which is, I mean, it's not, you know, you're not, it's not a losing play to bet 40,000. I just think it's, you're maximizing your return better by shoving. Um, he goes ahead, and, you know, but he's always going to call 40,000. I think he's, you know, he maybe, maybe he folds to the shove, but you know, he always calls 40. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to get behind the logic here. Um, uh, I guess my logic at the time was, uh, that I didn't want to, I kind of was afraid of shoving <laughs> being so close to the bubble and then thinking he was trapping me with aces. But then again, I wanted to, if he did have a worse hand, I still wanted to get some value from it. I know it, it didn't make sense at the time because my heart was like on the bubble. I want, I didn't want to be in a super big hand, but here I am in a big hand. Yeah. And it was like things were sped up That's at the crazy. moment. Totally. So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of times you find yourself in spots that um, are stimulating and, you know, it's hard to play like objective poker in those spots. I am empathetic to that. So I understand, you know, that narrative. Um, one thing I like doing is just trying to step back from it and say, you know, what is the correct play here and remove the I from the situation. So when I get caught up and like, this is my hand, this is what I'm trying to do. It, it, it feels, um, it, it, it's so emotional, right? Cause I have an attachment to the result, but when I'm just trying to figure out, you know, objectively, as if I'm reviewing the hand for somebody else, like I am doing with you now, it's easy to analyze the hand correctly. It's easy to stay focused and just say, oh, this is what I should have done. This is, you know, this is what the best play is. This is the EV move. Let's do that. And so I try to create that narrative for myself in real time by saying, you know, what is the correct play to do here? What should you do here? And talk to myself in the third person. Um, the second person helps, helps a lot. Um, you know, or the third person, like what should Robert do here? Right, like, because it just removes yourself from that um, first-person point of view where you're like shaking because you're concerned about the results of the hand. Um, so, you bet forty thousand, he calls, and now there's a jack on the river. You have a small pot size bet left. You have not, you know, not even a pot size bet left. A fourth of a pot size bet left. Um, and so here, this is a really tough spot. Um, he checks. And now you're basically getting value from tens and queens and you're losing to nines, jacks and aces and you're tying with kings. So there's more combos of queens and tens than there are of jacks and nines because of the fact that the nine and the jack are on the board. But we also have to think about a few other things. So these are the things I'd like to consider in this spot. One is that he might fold tens. So you might not get value from tens if he has them. The second is that while he is always going to call you with queens and you do win with that hand, you're always going to get called by hands that beat you. And the value of you increasing your stack by 66,000 is probably not worth the risk reward of folding, keeping your stack and pretty much folding your way to the money. So I might be a little bit more inclined here to check just because your odds against if he has nines, tens, jacks, queens, kings, and aces you're EV against those hands. The, the, the percentage that you're going to win against those hands is 50%. So if he has nines, tens, jacks, queens, kings, and aces, you're going to win half the time. And you're going to get called every time you're beat. But you're not going to always get called when you have the best hand. You're not going to always get called when he has tens. He might fold tens at this point. Because he might be like, well, it's the rest of my stack. Like, you three bet preflop and bet three times. It's not like there's that many bluffs in your range. He might get away from tens. So I might just fold here. I might just check here. Excuse me. I won't fold. I might just check here, even though you have a small amount left. Um, because the preserving, especially on a money bubble, like if you were on the final table bubble, hypothetically, or on the money bubble, preserving your current stack. And this might, you know, it's, it's less applicable when you have one fifth of the pot but it's the theory that I want everybody to understand here. The idea behind why checking has merit is that preserving your stack has more value than doubling the remainder of your stack. So if you're 50-50 here, yes, you're getting a good price on the size of the pot, but what you're not getting a good price on is the EV of doubling your stack. Because doubling your stack doesn't help you as much as going bust hurts you. Because if you double your stack, 
if you double the 66,000 that you have left, the value of your stack doesn't double. But if you bust it, your stack value goes to zero. So I think I would play a little bit cautious here and check this spot and go, and even though I'm gonna win, have the best hand and win at showdown a decent, like a decent amount of the time and I could have potentially doubled up, I don't think that, I think that the, that doesn't outweigh the risk of him having jacks, nines, or aces and me going bust. Even though I think aces is super unlikely, but basically you're worried about jacks more than anything. But jacks is a really likely hand that he can have, right? I mean, it's basically tens, jacks, or queens are the really likely hands. Tens he might fold, queens he's gonna call you, jacks you lose. So it's like, it's really tough. You know, he could still have nines as well. So I think, I think I would just play a little bit cautious. I mean, the reason that I would consider betting is just that you have one fifth of the pot. If I had 120,000, I think this would be a, a, a check. Um, yeah, uh, I wish I would have checked it, Alec. I really wish I would have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's not only be results oriented, right? I mean, you bet 40,000 again, which is very weird. I mean, you're basically, <laughs> yeah. leaving, you're yeah. basically leaving yourself three big blinds. Um, which doesn't really make sense. I think here I'm just going to shove or fold. I don't really understand. It's not like if he check raises all in, you're going to like fold and then like win the tournament with three big blinds, especially when the big blinds coming around. So I don't really understand this play at all. I think I would just shove if I bet. Now he check raises all in. Now you're getting what? 14 to one or something like that. Uh, the pot's not quite 400,000. It's actually less. You have to call 26 to win like 350. So yeah, I mean, you're getting like 13 to one. You have to be right like 7% of the time. You know, is he bluffing 7% of the time? I don't know, probably not. I, you can maybe even like make a ridiculous fold here. Um, he's probably bluffing, you know, 1% of the time. Um, yeah. He probably has a worse hand, you know, literally 1% of the time. And you need him to have a worse hand, something like 7% of the time. So I would probably, even though this is so ridiculous, I'd probably just fold this um, and just assume he has jacks always. Um, you know, the, the, you usually can't narrow people's range down so much like you can in this hand. But when someone calls 40,000 cold preflop, from the small blind on the money bubble, which is a fourth of their stack, yeah. you know, you can really narrow their hand range down and know that they have one of a couple hands. So I would probably be a little bit more conservative here with my Kings on the river in both aspects, right? Whether I'm considering checking or um, just folding to that raise but i mean i can't really blame you it's not like a terrible mistake to call it off it's three big lines but um anyway it's an interesting spot and um i got a question here that was interesting you know what would you be doing if this was in a cash game and a cash game you know you would play this differently because there is no icm in play right they're not worried about the fact every chip is worth a dollar so you're not worried about the fact that you know if you fold uh, you're going to have more chips to play with later and that's going to come into your decision-making process. That stuff doesn't happen in cash games. And so in cash games, I would just be shoving the river here. If he has me beat, whatever, you know, if you're 50, 50, or you're like 54% to win on the river and the, you have a fifth of the pot size bet left, you should just shove, right? You're getting a good price. You have your slight favorite. If you're a favorite by 1%, uh, you should take those edges because every chip is worth a dollar. In tournaments, it's just not that way. So this is an interesting hand, Robert. I think there's a lot to learn from it. Thank you for being so kind to share with it. Um, I'd like to open this up to questions before we go. We've already been here 45 minutes, so I'd like to take a few questions from people here. Um, you guys can drop them here in the chat. Um, and, yeah, if someone has a question, feel free to – raise their hand too. Um, I'd like to get you on the show here. I see quite a few people in here. Thank you guys so much for joining me. You guys are awesome. Um, 
Let me see. I'm going to look through a few questions here before we wrap up. I'm going to try and do this more often. If you guys have hands to submit, please click the link below. If you're watching this on YouTube, there'll be a link on the description below where you could submit your hands to me and we'll get them for future videos. Uh, that would be awesome. I also have a free download for you guys that's amazing. Um, hand reading system. It's basically the way that the thing that I use to make decisions at the poker table. Um, it's like the blueprint I use. So every time I'm faced with a decision on pre-flop, flop, turn river, I, I, I go through a step-by-step -step thought process. And I share that with you in a free download. You just enter your email at consciouspoker.com or you can click the link below and I'll give you access to that too. So there's some really good content in there. And um, just as a thank you for everyone for being here today. Um, thank you guys. I've seen a lot of, a lot of thank yous for everyone in the chat. Um, Robert, this was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your hand. Thank you so much. I'm going to try and do this again. I'm going to try and make it actually live on YouTube tech permitting um, and be able to share this with people on YouTube, you know, reach a lot, a lot bigger of an audience as well, instead of recording it and then putting it up on YouTube. So, um, that's it. We're 45 minutes. So it was my goal here to do 30 to 45. So I'm going to go and I will talk to you guys all next time. Thank you so much. Everyone that joined me, you guys are amazing. Hit me up on social media. Say that you were here. If you have questions that I didn't answer, uh, hit me up and I'll catch you guys next time. Thanks everyone for your support. Robert, you're a legend. Everyone. Cheers. Thank you, Alec. See you guys.